off-the-cuff design, an online magazine that is given out freely. The wide range of promotional is unlimited. We take pride in bringing it all together for you. And we recognize that it is hard to reach a lot of people by just having a website, or even those writers that do not have the means to advertise or have a website. This website will provide its free services of advertising and giving others a platform to share their experiences, skills, and ability. For we believe that it is through others we learn not only of others, but of ourselves as well. So, if you need a chat room to hold sessions, we can provide that with audio and video for classes, workshops, or just single sessions. Contact us to see what we can provide with our special features and promotional experience. And it is all free. Yes, free. Join us and meet other like-minded people because that is what makes OTC the place to be. OffTheCuffDesign.com Welcome to the Linda Irwin Show on Off The Cuff Radio airing Fridays. Be sure to visit offthecuffyzine.com also to view their wonderful publications that come out the first of every month. Off the Cuff is blessed to have some wonderful columnists with a variety of skills and experiences to help you in every aspect of your spiritual life. Also be sure to visit Cosmic Counseling on Facebook and at offthecuffezine.com as well as listen to all of the other fabulous shows here on the Off the Cuff radio channel. Now for Linda Irwin with her very special guest, author Garnet Schulhauser. I'm OTCR Linda Irwin, and I'm up in the Idaho Mountains, and I've got a wonderful guest lined up for you today. I want everybody to meet Garnet Schulhauser, but first let me tell you just a little bit about him. Garnet Schulhauser is a retired lawyer who lives near Victoria on Vancouver Island with his wife Kathy and little dog Abby. Hello, Abby. After practicing corporate law for over 30 years in Calgary with two blue chip law firms, he retired in 2008, and his first book, Dancing on a Stamp, was published in 2012. Since the release of his first book, Garnet has been active with book signing tours and speaking engagements and has been a frequent guest on radio talk shows. He also has two other books out, Dancing Forever with Spirit and Dance of Heavenly Bliss. How are you today, Garnet? Just fine, thank you, Linda. How about you? Oh, it's a little chilly here in Idaho, and I guess it's raining where you are. Yes, it is. Hmm. Well, this is a good time to get warm and cozy and stay dry and come listen to some amazing stuff that you've had in your life. Why don't you start out telling us a little bit about Albert? Well, Albert is one of my spirit guides, and uh, how I met him was um, I was still practicing law back in 2007, and I was strolling down the street one sunny afternoon in May, and suddenly out of nowhere, a homeless man just jumped out in front of me. And he looked like a typical homeless man, except that he had these amazing, dazzling, sparkling blue eyes that uh, that were penetrating deep within me, and at the same time sending me this, this wave, this gush of pure, unconditional love that was infusing my whole body with an amazing sense of peace and security. And so I stood there like a deer caught in the headlights, sort of basking in the glow from this man. And then uh, he broke the spell by saying to me, why are you here? And he promptly disappeared into a nearby store. And when I finally collected my wits, I went into the store to try to find him. I needed to know who he was and why he'd stopped me and, and, uh, and, and, and you know, all the things about him. I was very curious. But he was nowhere to be seen in the store, uh, and I went outside in the street again and walked up and down and tried to spot him. But he had seemingly disappeared into thin air. Hmm. And so the very next day, I went back to the same street at the same time, hoping I could spot this guy again. And after walking up and down uh, a several block radius, uh, I finally spotted him sitting on, all alone on a bench. And I walked up to him and I said, 
who are you and why did you stop me the other day? And he said, I'm a soul just like you. I'm here to answer your questions and help you on your journey. And that was the beginning of a dialogue that I had with this man off and on over the next several months. And I found out his name was Albert, and he said he was one of my spirit guides in disguise, and that he had physically manifested himself to me as the homeless man to get my attention and draw me into the conversation. Because he said that if he had just started talking to me as a voice in my head, I likely would have thought I was losing my mind. And so that was his way of introducing himself to me. And so after the first three times, he no longer showed up as a homeless man, but he was a voice in my head, and we communicated by telepathy. And that, that encounter and his revelations um, uh, led to my first book, Dancing on a Stamp, which he asked me to write so that everyone would have his revelations you know, uh, readily available. And then um, after the first book was done, he came back into my life again, Linda, in a slightly different format. He uh, appeared in my bedroom one night. I woke up one night suddenly, and I saw this ghost-like sort of uh, ethereal figure standing in the doorway of my bedroom. And when it moved closer towards the foot of my bed, I could see it was my old friend Albert, but he was in astral form. And he said to me, come with me. I'm going to take you on some astral trips to the spirit side, to other places in the universe, because I want you to write about what you see and hear in your next book. So then he just literally grabbed my, pulled my astral body out of my physical body, and we floated up through the ceiling and, and up to a, a high spot above our beautiful planet. And then from there, we, in our first trip, we went over to the spirit side. And so that led to my second book, Dancing Forever with Spirit. And then uh, after that one was finished, he came back into my life again in, in astral form, same format, showing up in my bedroom unannounced. And this time he took me on a different series of excursions in astral form um, to other planets in our galaxy and, uh, and to meet very interesting souls on the spirit side. And that led to my third book, Dance of Heavenly Bliss. Wow. And you know what's interesting about that is that the Christmas carol that we've all grown up and read when we were young, yes, the three spirits that do exactly that same thing. So that's not mythology, that's fact. I know I have been in that situation myself. I have been taken the same way, and I have also taken others. So it can happen very easily. You just have to be in the right place and the right time and ready on some sort of super conscious level, I believe, wouldn't you say? I'm not quite sure uh, how it, it, it happened with, with Albert and I. I. Albert seemed to do all of it. I'm not sure that I didn't really have to prep myself. In fact, the first time he came to me in astral form, I was totally surprised because he had warned me about it. I didn't know it was coming. And so there he was, and then he just sort of he was my uh, my tour leader. Basically, he, he guided me through uh, to all these places. And he had a very set agenda, Linda. He wanted me to see very specific things and talk to certain people that he had picked out because he thought that in all these encounters there was a lesson to be learned or a nugget of wisdom for all of us and so he, he had a very set agenda I couldn't dictate where I went uh, and so I was sort of totally in his hands mm. yeah it's like that I remember once in 1989 I was standing up in my apartment and had a glass of tea in my hand when all of a sudden I was in this classroom somewhere but I wasn't physically in the classroom. It was just my soul, my sentience. And they were showing me grid lines is what they called them back then, but we call them ley lines today. And he had this big map of everywhere I'd ever lived since the day I was born in this lifetime, pointing out that everywhere I'd been, I lived on one of these ley lines. And when I came to, back in the physical body, I had gently been laid down on the floor. And it was just an amazing experience. And back in 1989, they didn't really focus on that kind of thing so much. So I felt very fortunate to be given a heads up about all of that. Sounds like a great experience, Linda. And you're right, in 1989, um, not many people would have listened to you or believed your story because there weren't th that many spiritual enlightened people back then. There certainly are a lot more now. So I think your story would, uh, would certainly find a, a very receptive audience today. Yes, and you have met with some beings that people may or may not believe in, right? Oh, absolutely, yes. I, I've, I've met with, uh, uh, yeah, certainly on Earth, I've met, met with, uh, uh, with a couple of, of fabled Earth creatures, mythical creatures that have been the stuff of legends for a long time, like a Sasquatch and an Irish fairy. Uh, and I can tell you, I uh, had very interesting conversations with them, uh, and they are real. Uh, they, uh, in, in both cases, what, you know, the Sasquatch lives in the 
forested areas of uh, you know mountainous regions of you know Pacific Northwest, uh, other places on our planet as well. Irish Ferry, of course, in Ireland, and they they both are very sensitive, intelligent creatures who have been forced to hide, stay in hiding because they're afraid of hum- of humans because they view us to be violent and aggressive beings, and so they stay in hiding. The Sasquatch, they live in uh, in, in caves underground, uh, and they have uh, they're very adept at at at, at uh, not being. Uh, uh, found by humans because they really don't want to be, uh, you know, captured by humans and and regarded as circus freaks or, you know, uh, prodded and pushed in a in a human laboratory to find out what makes them tick. They don't want to have any of that, uh, any part of that, and so they just avoid us. And the Irish fairies, they used to roam freely uh, above the ground in Ireland until humans arrived on the island eons ago. And uh, again, they found humans to be violent and aggressive and abusive, and so they were forced as well to live underground where they are still today. And both of these creatures, the Sasquatch and Irish Fairy, totally different sort of in physical form. Uh, You know, the Irish Fairy was like a a tiny, perfect uh, little lady about three feet tall, very beautiful. Sasquatch was like about nine feet tall with a, a... dark hair covering her body uh you know much like uh you know sort of like a very almost like a very large ape um and uh, so very physically different but 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 in in terms of their uh sensitivity they both had the same story that they wanted to live openly and and in peace and harmony with humans but they just found us to be not sort of at that stage yet and so they they've been forced to hide to remain in hiding so it was really an unfortunate tale and it really goes to show you that where there's smoke there's usually some fire so these legends weren't just sort of invented out of the thin air. There is some basis to them, and I actually found out, you know, the true basis for them because these creatures actually do exist. I think it's marvelous that you got to see them. It breaks my heart that we can't all get along. I mean, the diversity on this planet, all of the different beings, even amongst the humans. Why can't we all learn to just get along with each other, to be at peace with each other, to allow everyone to live as they are? That 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 just hurts me so much when I hear about the Sasquatch and the fairies being afraid to be out in the open like that. I just want to take them all and say, hey, you've got sanctuary here, <laughs> don't you? Well, I totally agree with you, Linda, and, and I just think that, that if all humans could, could have had a conversation with these uh, creatures that I did, I think things would change. But, there's, but you know, and the problem is, as you say, not only are humans abusive to other creatures and, you know, on our planet, we're abusive to each other, which is really unfortunate. And one of the things that Albert was really trying to hit home to me and, we, and that he wanted to uh, me to recount in my books is the fact that we really have to sort of change our ways because the, the abuse that we heap on one another and on our planet with our pollution and all, all the other creatures is just unacceptable. And if we continue on our way, it's going to end up badly for us. We really have to change our ways because we're on a course right now that could be disastrous if we don't sort of uh, switch gears and find another path. So that was one of the main overriding messages that Albert gave me throughout all of my encounters with him. Yes, and then there's also the extraterrestrial beings, which I've been fortunate to be in contact with many, not only of this time space, but of other dimensions and time spaces as well. And you've had that experience? Yes, I did. I had a, a couple of encounters. One was in a, a, a on a planet sort of many late years away from Earth, and Albert took me there astrally. And as you as you know, Linda, when you travel astrally, it's basically it's virtually instantaneous to get mm-hmm. from point A to point B. It, you're not restricted by the speed of light. And so this was a planet many light years away. Um, it was uh, w- where the creatures there lived underground, and they were sort of like they looked like sort of similar to spiders, but they were sort of larger very intelligent we communicate by telepathy and they have been uh you know uh, their civilization has been around for a long time very advanced and one of their their roles was to monitor all the planets in our galaxy to find out when a planet might be uh, ready to sustain life and when that happened they would report it to the galactic council uh, who would then arrange for various et races with you know faster than light spacecraft to transport uh, life from one planet to one of these new planets that was capable of harboring life. And, and and they said that's in fact how life on Earth was seeded originally because they noticed that Earth was ready to ready to go in that regard and they notified the council and so all of the, or most of the life that we have on Earth was seeded here by ETs a long time ago, including humans. And then I, then I had an encounter with, a, with an ET race that was uh, in, in a large ship circling Earth 
and they were uh, also very intelligent. They were, you know, obviously a different race. They had been monitoring Earth right from day one. They were very benevolent. Uh, their goal was to try to help humans, uh, you know, with their struggles with the journey to try to get over their negative emotions uh, and to advance. And they were very concerned right now that um, uh, humans were at a, uh, a crucial point in our development, uh, and they were afraid that because we had we have the capability of destroying ourselves and all other life on the planet. They were afraid that that was the path that we might end up taking, and they really wanted to avoid that because they had watched previous human civilizations on our planet, like Atlanta and Lemuria and some others we've never heard of, uh, rise up to great heights and then end up uh, destroying themselves, crashing and burning because they weren't able to uh, control their negative emotions or, or let their greed and, and uh, desire for power get under control. And so they're, they're very much uh, there. They're just one of many alien races that have been monitoring Earth for a long time, as, and, and I'm sure you've met many of them, Linda, uh, and, and they're all... Uh, I, I was very uh, very uh, uh, enlightened by my encounter with them, and very grateful to the fact that these very advanced creatures uh, were there to help us. They were not malevolent in any sense, uh, and they really wanted to help us, but they were restricted by, by sort of... I mean, they, they had the, the, the capability to sort of destroy all of our weapons if they chose, but, by, but they were restricted by the prime directive to not unduly interfere with what happens on our planet. So they had to stand by and watch us as we went through all the wars and conflicts with, that we've had over our history, and, and they are really trying to uh, you know, hope that, that we won't do the same to our civilization now like we did with some of the previous ones. Well, I have a confession to make. I'm from the Pleiades. I found this out at the end of 2003 when my dad took me astrally to see them. And guess what? They're not all tall, blonde, Nordic types. They look like every <laughs> every type of person that's on the planet Earth. That junk DNA that we have, a lot of that is Pleiadian. And I am one of those people that was part of the downfall of Atlantis. It was my first trip to Earth. And I got into the Ministry of Science. In fact, I was talking back in the 90s about the crystal pyramids in the ocean near the Bermuda Triangle. Now, everybody thought I was nuts. Well, a couple of years ago, they actually discovered those. So, yeah, I remember that time, and I've spent all these lifetimes since then trying to undo the damage, the mindset that caused that, the greed, the need for power. And I've also met the spider beings. They came to me one night and gently touched me. It was sort of a light, staticky touch. And they were telling me that they were from a different time space, a dimension that overlaps ours. And I thought they were the most amazing creatures. I just loved them. Yeah, I think you may have met the same, some of the same ones that I did. Um, and, and I've also talked to other people, Linda, who have uh, uh, had previous lives in Atlantis. Uh, so I think there's a number of them, you know, around, and not everyone, uh, you know, recognizes or remembers that fact. So you're fortunate to, to know that. But um, you know, and I think that that part of the mission for people who, as you say, who did live during the time of Atlantis before it was destroyed are here now to try to save this civilization from a similar fate. Oh, definitely. And also, too, I remember it wasn't in my particular lifetime in Atlantis, but my people that lived in Atlantis before everything also started a war with Lemuria. I was told that Lemuria was a very peaceful civilization. They cared for each other. They did all of their own agriculture, and they had their own abilities that the Atlanteans were jealous of. And so they started a war and tried to take everything from the Lemurians. And to this day, my heart breaks for everybody who was there at that time in Lemuria. Yeah, it's an unfortunate uh, quirk of history, but 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 you know, it's it's been the sort of the the events that have sort of plagued humanity on our planet over the over the time period. You know, uh, either destroying themselves or getting into wars and destroying each other. And it's really unfortunate, but. Um, you know, that, that's just, I mean, that's all water under the bridge now. We can't change that, but we can sort of make sure that our current civilization doesn't uh, doesn't go down the same path. And, and I think that's why, as Albert has told me, he says that the, the good spirits, the Council of Wise Ones on the spirit side, they're, they've been very active in, in, in recruiting uh, very advanced souls uh, to uh, incarnate on Earth to try to help humanity get over this hump that we're in. Um, and they, uh, they've also been very adept at blasting out messages through many different messengers on Earth, uh, people who host radio shows like you do, Linda, or write books like I do, to try to get the message out to our fellow humans that we have to, have to change our ways. We have to discard our negative emotions, and we have to embrace love and compassion and forgiveness. And that's how we're going to sort of get over this 
this this crucial spot that we're in and raise our vibrations with the goal of ultimately rising up to the to earth in a higher dimension the which some people call the new earth yes and also social media came about at a time when we needed to be able to get the message out globally and instantly i was told that as well so yeah, yeah and, and, and a social little media is certainly, is certainly very helpful. Uh, it's certainly I use it all the time, and I assume you probably do too. It's a mm-hmm. great way to get the message out. Um, and uh, our, our only hope is that, that there's going to be more and more people as time goes on who actually sign on, listen to the message, and 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 and, and uh, make it part of their lives. Because we have to sort of we have to walk the the talk, not just talk the talk, and we have to sort of work hard to not only change our lives, but but convince others around us to change their lives as well. And then that. And, and, and Albert says, you know, it, sometimes it looks very dire for our situation. Situation, you know, if you listen to the nightly news, it looks pretty awful with all the terrorist activities and murders and wars and so on. He says, but if we all pull together, we can get over this part. And he's very optimistic that we will actually make through make it through this and uh, end up uh, not destroying ourselves. I agree. If we just light one candle at a time and pass that candle along, eventually the whole world will be lit up, right? Exactly, and that's the, that's the mission we're on, and uh, I'm trying to do my best to get that mes- message out, and uh, I, I certainly understand that you're trying to do the same, and so uh, it, it's just a matter of we all have to dig down deep and, uh, and work away at it and uh, never give up. Okay, well, we're coming up to about the middle of the show, so I'm going to go ahead and we'll take a break here, and we'll be right back. You are listening to OTCR, so we will talk at you in just a moment. This wall's been building in your mind But you'll find a way to live these dreams you hold inside You can't just live within your grasp Cause what's out of reach are all the things that you were meant to be Everything you see is broken 
Welcome back to Off the Cuff Radio. It's with Linda Irwin, and my guest today is Garnet Schillhauser, author of Dancing on a Stamp and many, many more. How did you get the title, Dancing on a Stamp? Well, it's interesting, Linda. It was uh, when I was having a conversation uh, one of the times uh, in speaking with Albert, um, I ended up complaining about something that wasn't going right in my life. And he said to me, he said, you know, your problem is is that you're not sort of, uh, uh, you, you, you're staying on one spot. You're not getting out and exploring the, you know, everything there is in your beautiful world. And he said, you know, imagine that uh, as a metaphor that the world is like a big, beautiful ballroom and that everyone in the ballroom is uh, up and dancing to the wonderful dance music that's going on and they're swirling all over the big, be- beautiful ballroom. But he says, you... Are, are standing on one spot like you have leg shackles on and he says you need to break free from your shackles get out of your comfort zone and quit dancing on a stamp <laughs> and, and I, I like thought that, that phrase was kind of neat and I, and I thought that, that would make a good title for my book oh yeah it surely puts things in perspective kind of like the pebble on the beach right yeah exactly so what other amazing astral experiences have you had? I understand you've also met with some beings who, again, people may or may not believe, but that are historical and of legend. Oh, oh yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, I met, I met uh, I had a number of trips to the spirit side, and uh, uh, one of the trips I met with uh, with the, the soul who, who had lived his last life on earth as Moses, who was a very uh, you know, dominant historical character, especially in the Bible. And uh, so it was a very interesting conversation. He said that, uh, you know, the uh, <coughs> excuse me, all the uh, the plagues that he visited on Egypt in, a, in an effort to convince the Pharaoh to release his people from slavery, he says they weren't caused by God because he said that God or the source doesn't really manipulate things on our planet. He, he caused them himself because he's a master soul who was able to uh, focus his thoughts into powerful beings of energy. So basically he... He instigated all the events that people have ascribed to him as miracles, um, and, uh, and he was also instrumental in, uh, in, in, in getting his people across the Red Sea. He said he actually didn't part it as such, but he created an interdimensional wormhole that his people could uh, uh, travel through to get to the other side of the Red Sea. And so, uh, so that was his story. And he said, uh, uh, you know, the, the Ten Commandments that he created uh, didn't come from God because he says the God. He confirmed what Albert had already told me. Uh, that the, the God or the source does not make rules for us to follow. Uh, Moses said he conceived of the Ten Commandments at, during a period of deep medication, and he came back and told his people that they came from God because that would have more force and effect mm-hmm. than, they, than if he said just came from him. But So that's how the Ten Commandments were created. So that was one interesting encounter. Um, I also had a, a conversation with uh, with Jesus Christ, who, is a, who was and still is a very uh, advanced master soul, he told me that he uh, uh, he incarnated as Jesus Christ, the human, um, you know, over 2,000 years ago. He did so at the request of the Council of Wise Ones. They wanted somebody like him to come and try to uh, try to uh, uh, help mankind become more spiritually enlightened, to try to, to set aside their negative emotions and embrace love. Um, and so he came there to, to preach his message of love and forgiveness and, and hope. And, and try to convince humans to to, uh, to live better lives and to love and respect one another more than they already had been. So he oh. incarnated, uh, you know, uh, t- solely to do that. And a- a- as like Moses, he said that the miracles ascribed to him in the Bible, like walking on water and turning water into wine, w- were the result of the fact that he, as well, could focus his thoughts at the powerful beams of energy. So he basically created all those events um, uh, th- that uh, have been called miracles. He did so to draw attention to himself because he felt that way he'd have a more of a following. And uh, I-, I mean, and it worked. I mean, uh, the Christian church has like over 2 million followers. So he started an amazing movement. Um, and he said that he's not happy with some of the, some of the uh, rules and beliefs that the, the holy men who followed him have developed for the Christian church. But he, but he likes the fact that they're still spreading his core message, and he, and he, and, and 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 overall, he's happy. He says you can't predict where humanity will go once you sort of uh, start an idea or a movement with them, and so he's he's watching sort of with fascination as as the church developed, and uh, uh, and, and he's a very interesting soul, very, very compassionate, wise soul. Uh, and I said to him, you know, if you could if you could create miracles yourself, why did you let yourself be crucified on the cross? And he said, well, I could have prevented that of course but he thought it would make a, ba- a more dramatic statement for his followers 
if he he if he died on the cross and then later rose from the from the grave and ascended up to heaven and so that's why he allowed his crucifixion so he was a very uh very compassionate soul who really wanted to do his best to help humanity uh you know further their cause and become more spiritually enlightened yes i've always had that feeling i've never actually been told but i always felt that he came here to show us who we truly are and how we need to love and respect each other and that the miracles are not miracles at all but something that we are all capable of doing just that it's been suppressed you know by those in authority and of course the crucifixion to show that we live on after we leave the body no matter how badly damaged we are to start living and realizing that we are in eternal sentience it isn't something that just goes away when the body dies no, absolutely, and that, and that was one of the things that, that, that Albert kept on hammering home to me was is that he said, you look at you and everyone else, you're all eternal souls, uh, and when your physical body dies, that's just a transition point where your soul leaves your physical body and transitions back to the spirit side. The spirit side, of course, which some people refer to as heaven or the other side or beyond the veil, but that's our true home. That's where we are, exist in our natural state as beings of energy, and that that's and we come here incarnate as humans on earth to learn and experience things to help us with our evolution and it's by our own free choice and so we're all here on a journey of exploration and learning that we chose before we were born Linda as you know uh, even though we don't remember that but it but it's all part of uh, part, part of the the evolution that we have as souls to try to become more wise and more advanced in our uh, in our travels and as we explore the universe and and, and he as he said many times we, we don't just have to incarnate on earth as humans we can incarnate as animals we can incarnate as as uh, living life forms on other planets and there's millions and millions of other life forms on other planets and you mentioned that you had originally been a palladian that's just one example of, of, of a place that you can incarnate mm-hmm. in fact there are many types of forms that you can incarnate into i know people that have been in the reptilian group as well as the insectoids and even what they call the Roswell Grays, the Zeta Reticulans. And they all have their own upbringing, their own culture, their own society, and their way of doing things and their belief systems. And I believe that in order to expand ourselves as souls, we have to experience all these different ways of being, whether it's just being in a physical planet that has plants and animals that we use to sustain our physical bodies, or a planet that uses methane to breathe, or, or those that live underwater, there's just an endless variety of places we've been i believe and that we've experienced no i I totally agree with you and and uh you you know and the neat thing about it linda is that as souls we get to choose sort of where we go in what order and what we want to experience and and sort of we, we 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 map out our own path for evolution in terms of you know you know which planets we go to first, which ones we go to second and third, and so on, and 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 what kind of life forms we want to live in, and you know we uh, you know there are some people uh, uh, who are uh, humans on Earth who have been in many many different life forms. There are some who've only been in a few, and there are some who are basically uh, uh, new souls who have just started off by being animals on Earth and gradually progress up to humans, and so. Everyone has a different path. No one dictates our path to us, and there's no timetables or deadlines for evolution. We can we can go fast, we can go slow. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's entirely our choice, which which really makes it attractive, you know, uh, uh, intellectually for me because there's I know that there's nobody dictating my path of evolution. I choose it for myself. Exactly, and one of the things we've come to learn in more later years, at least in our generation, is how advanced whales and dolphins are. We always think of them as just fish in the sea, even though they're mammals. But they're very intelligent creatures, and they have the power to communicate through telepathy. And they are helping trying to change the planet, too, for the better. Absolutely. And I I can actually uh, uh, tell you that I had the experience firsthand, which I describe in my third book, uh, Dance of Heavenly Bliss, where I had a conversation with a killer whale, an orca, that was a captive in an aquarium. Um, and, and uh, again by telepathy and this killer whale was a very uh, wise, sensitive uh, uh, spiritual being um, and, and very intelligent and uh, she basically said you know, whales and dolphins are very intelligent, uh, in some ways more intelligent than humans, because they can communicate by telepathy and most humans cannot so they're more advanced than us they don't have any technology because they don't really need it they don't want it, they want to live close to nature in harmony with Gaia and, and that's sort of the 
their role here and they're very sort of upset at the, at the way that humans have been abusing them over the centuries you know with hunting and trapping them and or, or getting them caught in our uh, you know our nets and so on um, or like in her case capturing them in the wild and putting them into a concrete aquarium a concrete prison and her her plea to me was you know uh, try to convince your humans, uh, your fellow humans to let me go, I want to roam freely again in the ocean and try to convince them that whales and dolphins, we just want to live in harmony, in peace and harmony with humans we don't want to cause you any harm but we really hope that you stop the harm that you have been causing us over the years very definitely and Gaia herself is alive the planet itself, and I remember a phrase in the Bible that always stood out to me, and even the rocks cry out that's because the rocks of Earth are very much alive, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I actually I had a conversation with Gaia, which I describe in my third book, um, and which was uh, Albert took me on an astral trip. We went we went to the North Pole, dropped down to the ocean, underneath the the uh, subsurface of the land, into a cavern, and there I had a conversation with Gaia, and and it surprised me a bit because at the time I wasn't aware that that uh, Gaia was a, a, like a living consciousness. And, and I found out soon enough that Gaia, the consciousness of Mother Earth, um, is, is very wise, sensitive, uh, very protective. Gaia wants all of her flora and fauna to live in peace and harmony. And, 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 uh, you know, and she was really quite upset, just like the orca was, uh, that humans had been sort of, uh, you know, with all our, our pollution, we're harming not only um, Mother Earth and her other creatures, but we're harming ourselves as well. And she basically said, look, if humans don't change their course that they're on, don't stop the pollution, don't stop the abuse, we're going to end up, uh, or we could very well end up in, uh, in very bad times. Um, and, uh, you know, that was her plea to me was to say, look, humans, you've been making some good progress in terms of curbing your pollution in the last few years, but you need to do a lot more than that. Uh, otherwise, it could end up, end up badly for us. I agree. So if everybody listening to this show would pass the information along, share the link where you can, we'd like to get this message out to as many as we can because it is time to turn things around. We've been going down this negative, destructive road for too long. We love this planet. Let's make this planet sustainable, peaceful, beautiful, and happy again. Uh, Garnet, we're running down on time a little bit. I've only got the 45-minute plan, but... Can you tell everybody about your books and how all the different places they can reach you? Sure. The best source of information, Linda, is my website, which is garnetschulhalser.com. That's not easy to remember, but if, the, if you Google Dancing on a Stamp or Dance of Heavenly Bliss, you can get to my website. There's information uh, about all three of my books. You can download a free excerpt from each book. You can watch a book video for each book. Uh, you can... Uh, you can dial into all my social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and so on to get information about what's happening in my life and when my next books are coming out. Uh, there are buy links to, uh, uh, for my books to, to all the popular online bookstores like Amazon and Barnes and & and many others. You'd have to click on there and get right to the point where you can buy my books. Um, and my email address is, uh, is on my website. I'd be happy to have questions or comments from your readers. And finally... Um, there's a spot on my website where you uh, a, a page where you can listen to all the previous radio shows uh, that I've been on, and so far this is this is number uh, show number 112, uh, Linda, that oh, I've been wow. on, and, and people can uh, can listen to all of them or any of them if they want to. Oh, that'd be wonderful! I'll have to go do that. <laughs> 112 is a good number. I like that number. Yeah. Oh, do you have any closing thoughts before we go? No, just just the overriding message from Albert is that we, uh, our mission as humans is we need to uh, discard our negative emotions like uh, fear, anger, and hate, embrace love and compassion, and if we can do that, we'll make our world a better place to live in, we'll raise our vibrations, um, and uh, we'll have a much happier journey on this planet. Oh, I so agree. Garnet, thank you so much for being on with me today. I hope you stay warm and dry and tell Albert hello and give Abby a pat for me, okay? I will do, and, and Linda, thank you for inviting me on your show. Thank you so much. Well, everybody, our time is out, and I'm going to go ahead and say namaste, love everyone, peace everyone, and remember, OTCR, off the cuff, that's the place to be. Okay, well... Good night. Off the Cuff Design, an online magazine that is giving out freely. 
The wide range of promotional is unlimited. We take pride in bringing it all together for you. And we recognize that it is hard to reach a lot of people by just having a website or even those writers that do not have the means to advertise or have a website. This website will provide its free services of advertising and giving others a platform to share their experiences, skills, and ability. For we believe that it is through others we learn not only of others but of ourselves as well. So, if you need a chat room to hold sessions, we can provide that with audio and video for classes, workshops, or just single sessions. Contact us to see what we can provide with our special features and promotional experience. And it is all free. Yes, free. Join us and meet other like-minded people because that is what makes OTC the place to be. angels? Would you like to know about angels? Then join Peg Jones on OTCR's Wednesday's Whispers. Peg will guide you to just a glimpse of heaven through her knowledge of angels. Join Peg Jones for Wednesday's Whispers only on OTCR.